Hey everybody, this is Doug from Music Fit Reptiles, and today I'm doing the question and answer, a little Q&A video for you guys. Uh, trying to better tell you guys who I am, Doug, here at Hissy Fit Reptiles, and a little bit more about Hissy Fit Reptiles, how it got started, um, how it came to be, a uh, little history about everything. So uh, I've got a lot of questions to go through for, and answer for you guys, so stick around and find out more about Hissy Fit Reptiles. <laughs> everybody so I'm gonna go through the questions I'm gonna try to go in order of which they were asked on the comments however some questions kind of pertain to other questions that other people might have asked and uh, uh, some of them are actually uh, similar questions in general so I might jump around a little bit but um, I'm gonna be telling you who asked the questions what the questions were and then I'll answer them for you guys so um, to get started we'll go with the first question from Roger Kime Reptiles um, Roger asks, can you explain lethal genes in ball pythons? Um, yes and no. Uh, I have some genes that can make lethal combos where uh, the combos wouldn't thrive. Um, but I try not to do a lot of those combos. To, I, have, like I have spider genes. I have, if I have a male that has a spider gene, I try not to breed it with a female that has a spider gene. Uh, super spiders are known to be a lethal combo. Um, other ones would be like champagne stuff. I don't have any champagne in my collection right now. Um, however, uh, champagnes have been known to uh, uh, have lethal combos with like spider. Um, other ones would be like hidden gene woma and sable. Um, so if you want to find out more about some of these genes that could be lethal combos, uh, a really good one is if you go to Rafi Martinez's uh, YouTube channel and uh, he's got an interview he did a few years back with Kevin McCurley and it kind of explains some of the lethal genes. Um, and Kevin goes into great detail about that because he's dealt with a lot of that kind of different stuff. So um, I highly recommend checking that video out. Uh, if I can find it, I'll put the link in the description. But um, there's other genes too that aren't necessarily lethal, um, but just have problems like the desert gene. Um, the desert gene, the females um, cannot lay eggs. So something that happens with the eggs being bound up inside them and they can't, they can't lay their eggs and they end up dying. On, uh, typically they end up dying. Um, and that females just cannot lay eggs. Um, males are totally fine, but again, you have an issue with females. Uh, it kind of brings me up into a different point, point of things with the desert. Um, this right here is a desert ghost. So this is my desert ghost female. It's uh, actually a super pastel desert ghost. And just in case you guys ever hear me talk about my desert ghost animals, this is completely different than the desert gene. Desert Ghost is a completely different line of, of uh, genetics. This is a recessive gene, Desert Ghost is, and in order for Desert Ghost to exist, both parents have to at least carry the gene. Um, so Desert Ghost females can lay eggs no problem. So, um, and again, this is recessive where Desert was a dominant or co-dominant. I uh, can't really tell because the females can't lay eggs, so you can never find out if there's a super form or not. Um, but this right here, desert ghost gene that's in this snake, totally fine. This female will be able to lay eggs, no problem. All right, so going into the next question, Flesh Cleaver asks, what projects do you have for the next season? How to set up and regulate eggs? And do you have any snakes that you would consider pets that you handle often? And he also asked, are you planning to branch out to other kinds of snakes? Um, for projects that I have for next season, uh, kind of focusing a lot on the desert ghost stuff, um, trying to get desert ghosts into different things. I have some hets um, that I'll be breeding to the, to the visuals to produce some more um, desert ghost combos. Um, also, I'm trying to go for some clown pied stuff. I have a chance at hopefully producing a killer clown pied, which has never been produced before. This will be a super pastel clown piebald. Um, the, the female is possible hat clown, so if she doesn't prove out, I could still possibly end up with super pastel, uh, pieds or killer pieds. So that'd be something I can hopefully end up making, uh, 
red stripe, working with some of the red stripe stuff. So I have a red stripe male that breeding breed into a couple females. Um, also have a chance at producing some super orange dream stuff. I have a orange dream fire spider male that's also possible calico and possible leopard. I would breed into my orange dream yellow belly so I could possibly end up with some really crazy stuff there. Some super orange dream fire spider yellow belly stuff hopefully. So, um, so that's a good chunk of what I have going on for this coming season. Um, for setting up and regulating the eggs, um, right behind me here is my incubator. So I uh, made this incubator out of a Pepsi cooler. Uh, it's turned off now because I have no eggs in here. So uh, I'm not going to waste energy running it while there's nothing in there. Um, but what I do typically, and actually I just have a tub that still has this in it, so I'll pull that out. So this right here um, is the egg tubs that I have. Um, Typically there's a little bit more vermiculite in here, um, but I use vermiculite and you basically um, weigh the vermiculite dry and then whatever that weighs, you fill up a little cup of water, the exact same weight as the vermiculite, you mix that together and, and then you should be able to take the vermiculite up, squeeze it and water shouldn't come out of it, but it should mold to your hand because uh, it's got the moisture in there. So um, then I... I try to get these set up a couple days before I know the eggs are going to lay and then I let it stay in the incubator so the, so the, um, the sub or whatever you just call it, the, not substrate or bedding, but um, yeah, I guess substrate uh, would be the temperature that it needs to be in the incubator. So when I take the, the eggs from, from the mother, then at that point I put them in the egg tub and then put them in my incubator, which um, I believe I have it set for around 89.1 degrees and it, and it, maintains a really good temperature uh, throughout the whole entire um, top to bottom. So um, if we go into this breeding season, I'll probably go more in depth with my, with my incubator. Um, but I also think I have a video a few years back um, kind of explaining how I set up my incubator and how I built it uh, since I did it myself. So uh, other than that, going on to the next part of your question, um, do you have any stinks that you would consider pets that you handle often? Um, I did at some point. Uh, at one point I had a bumblebee female. She was kind of considered a pet. Um, she was the first ball python I ever got and uh, I handled her quite often. Uh, now that I have as many snakes as I do, I handle them all but not very often. You know, I don't handle each one like all the time. So um, some of them I handle more than others. I would say maybe like this one. I, I take her out. She just looks awesome. It's <laughs> hard not to look at her and just let her sit in a tub, you know, for a couple of seconds. I like to take her out every so often and um, she's really curious but really calm. I mean, I, I'm right by her head. She's not freaking out a whole lot or anything, so. But, uh, uh, and when I used to have my red-tailed boa, I used to handle her quite often. Um, so now with my ball pythons and the collection I have, um, and it's getting a little bit bigger, uh, like I said, I don't handle one particular one all the time. Um, I guess the one probably nearest and dearest to my heart as far as uh, what I have from um, my collection that I kind of, the only one that really has a name is the Killer Blast. That's a super pastel spider pinstripe. Um, she, we call her Mellow Yellow. She's super yellow. Um, maybe I'll bring her out here in just a little bit. Um, but yeah, I handle them. Just not all, not like one specific one all the time. Um, and then. Am I planning to branch out to other kinds of snakes? Uh, I'm going to actually get more into that question. Um, but yes, eventually I would like to get a few different, a uh, few other different uh, types of snakes. And again, I'll go into that a little bit further um, in another question that somebody asks. So, so stay tuned on that question. Uh, next up, Stoner Kivo 420 asks, How old were you when you got your first snake and what made you go to ball pythons? Um, so I was 27 years old when I got my first snake. Um, I was definitely afraid of snakes prior to owning my first one. Uh, definitely afraid. I was afraid of grass snakes, garter snakes, anything I saw that was a snake. I didn't want to go near it. Um, so, and I'm going to be going into that here in just a little bit as far as how I got over that fear. And um, kind of goes into uh, Larry Dutro's question later on when he asks, um, um, what moment was it? or what particular species got you into snakes? So when I get back into that question, I will um, I'll go more into detail with it. So, but I was 27 years old 
uh, when I got my first snake. Um, next question. Uh, Scales Exotics asks, heat tape or heat cable, and which keeps the most consistent temperatures? Um, I personally only have ever dealt with heat tape, so I really don't have any experience with the heat cable. Um, the only thing that I'm not sure if this is considered heat cable, but I had one of those under the tank heaters um, for some leopard geckos we had a, um, a few years back. Um, so I don't know if that's technically uh, considered a heat cable type thing, but that goes under the tank of a like a you know your terrarium, a 40 gallon terrarium or a 20 gallon terrarium or whatever. So um, overall, I think the heat cable or heat tape works great um, for the most part. One thing I do notice when you have a wider rack, like this, these are three three wide, ten high. Um, it seems like the middle tubs get the most heat. And you still get heat on the on the outside ones, but it's not not as uh, warm as the as the middle ones. And that's with both Freedom Breeder and ARS, and I think pretty much anybody along um, that has that kind of stuff. So, um, but yeah, other than that, I, I'm really not as familiar with heat cable. Um, so I'm sorry I can't answer that question any better. Uh, TNT balls. When do you start breeding your breeding season, and how? Um, actually, I kind of already started it. I started putting, uh, I put in a couple males with some females just to kind of see what would happen. And I already had a few locks actually. So, um, typically I wait till around Thanksgiving. Um, sometimes if there's a few, a few females that are, um, you know, that I think maybe might go a little early or something, I try to get up, you know, a male in with them. Um, this also goes into a couple other questions that some people had, um, about, how my breeding season goes, do I um, cool down and stuff like that, which I'll get into later. But for this specific question, um, I kind of start breeding now. Um, I used to kind of look at it at Thanksgiving, but now I kind of set Tinley Park in October um, as kind of my, my, all right, let's start putting a couple males and a few of the females. Um, I don't go full force on it or anything, but I just kind of start pairing a couple of things together to see. Um, now, like females that laid this last year, um, so my, like my pastel ivory, she didn't lay eggs until, I believe it was June. So I probably won't pair her anytime soon. I'll kind of wait a little bit because she's probably not going to lay much earlier than she did last year. If anything, she'll lay around the same time, maybe a month early, maybe a month later. Um, maybe not at all. Who knows? But but yeah, typically I'll um, kind of start off the few of the, the females that haven't bred like this female. I, I'm going to be putting the... Uh, leopard pinstripe het desert ghost male with her so um, I'll probably be doing that soon um, so next question Gwen Hooper asks who got you started in breeding ball pythons and then he asked what is your end goal with breeding ball pythons um, long story short the person that got me into breeding ball pythons that would be Garrick DeMeyer from Royal Constructor Designs he uh, was very instrumental into um, getting me uh, into the, the whole breeding aspect of it. Uh, when I contacted him, I was going to just get a, uh, a ball python and, and actually ask questions about my red tail boa. I didn't even, I wasn't even really in the market for ball pythons. I just wanted to get some questions and, and talk to him about my red tail boa. Uh, went to his website, found out that there's a whole bunch of different ball python morphs I had no clue about. I just saw the stuff at Petco. Um, but I'm kind of getting ahead of myself. I'm gonna get into that question a little bit later when. Um, Somebody kind of asked something that kind of goes more into the history of his fit reptiles and how I all started with the reptile business or hobby. Um, and then the end goal with breeding ball pythons, and I said and I said business in that because I was kind of thinking about this next answer. Um, what I wouldn't mind doing would be kind of more of a small scale business. Um, to me, it's always going to be still a hobby, something that I can do while I still have a regular job. I mean, I have a regular job now that I that I have. Um, but I, I eventually would like to be kind of a small scale business, something that I can kind of do when I retire from my current job, um, something I enjoy doing. So it, to me, it always will still be technically a hobby, but, um, but yeah, a small scale business, Not, nothing like, like BHB or Royal Constrictor Designs or um, anything like that, but something where it's, you know, pretty manageable and stuff. I know there's some big breeders out there that, you know, just do it more on a small scale, you know, just breed for quality, not quantity. And stuff like that. Not saying that like BHB and Royal Constructor, Royal Constructor Designs don't have quality because they do, um, but that's their only business, the only thing they do for a living. So, um, 
Next question. Um, this is kind of, it's actually two people kind of asked similar questions. Uh, Theory Family Balls asks, what is your favorite single gene to work with and why? And John Phillips asks, what is your favorite morph or combo? Um, so with that being said, I would have to say uh, Desert Ghost right now is kind of my favorite gene to work with. Um, and, and this is why. Um, this girl here, I, mean, I just weighed her. I have a scale in front of me. And um, some people can't believe it when I, when I tell them that this is how she looks at this weight. But I mean, this is not a baby. This is a this is a full grown adult female here. I mean, she could get bigger, but I mean, look at the coloration. I, the lighting right now. I'm, don't have the best lighting right now on here, but you can see here she is very yellow, very vibrant, very bright. She weighs one thousand six hundred and sixty four grams as of right now, and this is how she looks. Uh, this looks better than any super pastel baby you could probably ever find. So, again, this is a super pastel desert ghost. Why I like the desert ghost gene is because it makes an adult look as good or better than the baby looked when it was born. And typically, with most ball python morphs, when you, um, when you start to see them get older, you're going to see them brown out and kind of, you know, the color is going to change, but not necessarily for the better. Uh, with desert ghosts, when they change color as they get older, um, they get better. Just look at that. She is amazing, and pretty much any desert ghost combo I've ever seen is amazing. If you like the regular morph, let's say you like a lemon blast, you get desert ghost into it, you're gonna love it a lot more because that's not gonna turn into like a brownish, golden, you know, darker, you know, dirty looking snake as it gets older, like a lemon blast typically does. It's gonna be like a pure yellow, pinstripe looking animal um, with desert ghost in it. Uh, bumblebees as well. Bumblebees will stay that bright, vibrant yellow and black as they get older. And the black sometimes will kind of fade a little bit. You see there's a little bit of fading in here. Um, but it's still, it's not, um, it's not where it, it completely washes out completely. It's, it's, it's a great gene. I love this gene. Um, there's a lot of other genes I love too, and I want to get this into it. Um, so, um, my favorite more of a combo again like combos too with um clown combos i love clown combos so i really like to start getting desert ghost into there um and yeah uh, i love like the, the killer clowns that was one of the first few ball pythons i've seen that i was like holy crap i need to get into ball pythons because that is an amazing looking animal um but as as babies are so so bright and so immaculate looking but as adults, you know, they dull up a little bit and you see a killer clown as an adult, it's still an amazing animal, but it doesn't have the same wow factor as it did as a baby. I feel like Desert Ghost is going to do that when you see a killer clown with the Desert Ghost gene in it. So, um, there's that. Um, next question. Uh, Demonic Reptiles asked, besides reptiles, what other hobbies do you have? So in kind of went a little bit outside of the, the reptile stuff, which is cool because that's what I ask you guys to do too. You know, feel free to ask anything about me or Hissy Fit, Rept Hissy Fit Reptiles. Um, so I, I, I do have um, five, well, four kids technically right now, but we got the fifth on the way. So in January, we're expecting a baby girl. Um, so it'll be our second daughter. My wife and I have one daughter together. Um, and our daughter right now is five years old. And she just started kindergarten. Um, and then I have two boys with my ex-wife. And then my wife has a son from before um, our marriage and stuff. So, um, so we have, we have quite, a, quite a family. And so part of my hobbies is spending time with the family and, and doing stuff with them. Um, tonight, for example, my, my daughter has a fall festival thing going on at her school. So we're going to be going to that. Uh, kind of like a dance and crafts and... Um, all that kind of different stuff, so it's pretty interesting. Um, also, I love sports. Um, so, you know, football, um, baseball somewhat, but um, I like playing more sports, like um, golf. I, I don't really watch golf on TV or anything, but I like to play golf. I'm not good at it, but it's still fun to me. Um, so I watch football on TV as well. Um, also, I still watch WWE, <laughs> even though I know it's not as good as it used to be, um, and I'll admit that, but... Um, I grew up watching wrestling, WWE, and I know it's fake, um, but so are movies, so are video games, so are TV shows, and it's no different than any of them. Um, 
I guess, you know, the fact that it tries to be real, that's one thing. But, but yeah, I still watch wrestling. Um, so if you're watching wrestling out there, feel free to talk wrestling with me every so often if you want. Um, archery, um, I used to do a lot of archery tournaments, so uh, I shot bow for quite a lot quite a while. I haven't really done it so much recently, but um, something that I kind of been trying to get the kids into a little bit. Um, and I used to bow hunt, but I really haven't found a good spot to bow hunt where I live now. I used to live um, where I had new people that had land that could go bow hunting and stuff, but I don't, I would like to do that again. So I really would like to get into bow hunting again. Um, otherwise I play video games here and there. Uh, my wife's not crazy about video games, so I usually only do that when she's not around. Um, but the kids play video games, so I'll play with them. Um, watch movies with the family, and then I used to DJ. I used to be a DJ for like a mobile uh, DJ service that I owned and operated. Um, it was called Shattered Glass DJ Entertainment. So, um, so yeah, it was it was kind of fun. Um, got to be where I was spending a lot of time, a lot of my weekends away from my kids and stuff. So I, I got out of it from that reason. But I still like doing the whole music thing and and kind of messing around with that. Eventually I would like to get some more DJ equipment just to mess around here at home, not really to DJ again out and stuff like that. But um, I used to do the bar scene too, DJ at clubs and, and bars. So it was a lot of fun. Um, but those are some of the hobbies I have. Um, and then also he asks, uh, who are your favorite three YouTuber, reptile YouTubers? Um, so with that, it's hard to say. I, I end up watching a lot of YouTube channels. Um, and I think for the most part, I'm going to, it's hard for me to pick a favorite, especially amongst all you guys that have awesome videos as well. And I, I'm so far behind. I have such a huge backlog of video uh, videos to watch from all my people I'm subscribed to. Um, but I would say that uh, Garrick Demire's The Royal Constrictor YouTube channel, uh, whenever he posts a video, I always try to catch that because uh, even though I live near him and I can go over to his shop and see his stuff, um, a lot of times I don't like to bother him with that kind of thing. So um, I'll see the stuff that he's creating on his YouTube channel. Uh, along with all of you guys. I mean, if, if you guys watch this channel, he's always got some amazing stuff. Um, I, I try to watch, like, the, my favorite channels are the ones I can watch where they have stuff that they're making that I don't have or I would like to get into or um, genes I'm kind of curious about. Um, so I guess the next one I would say would be um, Jay Cabelka Reptiles. So Justin Cabelka produces some really crazy stuff. He's got a lot of really awesome combos that he makes. And when he posts videos, he usually has stuff that I have never seen before. Um, so I'd say he's kind of a favorite of mine as well. And then um, the other one would be Nerd. Um, Kevin McCurley, even though sometimes he doesn't even know what's in some of his ball pythons, uh, those things are just amazing looking. I, the jeans, I, a lot of jeans I don't have, and I don't know if I'll ever end up getting in my collection, but just some of his ball pythons are just amazing. So, um, But again, I, I can't really say that I have a favorite favorite. I just kind of look and see, and, and I... And if, I, if you have a YouTube channel and I haven't like commented or watched some of your videos, I apologize. I've been trying to catch up on a lot of stuff. Um, and while we were moving for last month, I got really behind on YouTube channels specifically. So uh, if I can take like a whole week and just watch YouTube channels and watch YouTube videos, I definitely would. Um, and then try to comment on you guys' stuff. But I always try to get as much reptile watching on YouTube in as I can. So, um, but... No hard feelings to anybody if if you are like, man, Doug hasn't ever commented on my video or I don't wonder if he even saw it. It's not because I was avoiding it. It's just sometimes I don't have the time and my wife's not the, the biggest uh, supporter of any of this stuff. So um, she doesn't like watching it or anything. So um, Going to the next question, uh, what is your dream reptile to own or breed if you haven't yet? Um, I would say probably a lychee. Um, so... Um, I can't remember the specific, it's uh, something Lichianus or something, but uh, Lichies, uh, they're, like the, they're the world's biggest geckos. Those things are so awesome. Uh, if you saw the Tinley Park video that I did, I actually featured um, uh, one of the breeders in there that had uh, Lichies, and I held on to one of them. It was just such an awesome feeling. It's like, it's like silk on your hands when you, the belly of them is so soft and stuff, and uh, pretty awesome animals. I would really like to get a Lichie um, as far as reptiles and stuff. Um, I do have my Tegus. Uh, I wanted those for a while. Um, I have two of them. I have a red um, Argentine Tegu and I have uh, a black and white Argentine Tegu. So um, so I do have two Tegus. That would be pretty cool um, once they get older and bigger. Um, but I don't know if I'll be breeding them or not. But, but yeah, that'd be uh, the lychees are pretty cool. I would definitely like to get one of those as a pet. 
Um, and that was uh, that question was from Matt Howell. Sorry if I didn't say uh, your name there before, Matt. So that was Matt Howell asked that question. And then a previous question, I'm not sure if I had mentioned it. I'm kind of, uh, I know it's going to be a long video, but um, demonic reptiles had asked that. Um, this next question is from Melissa McIntosh. She goes, where are you located and where do you get your shipping supplies from and who, in your opinion, is the best to ship with? So um, a lot of you aren't going to like the answer to this question because, um, well, I'm located in central Wisconsin. Um, that's not why you're not going to like the answer because um, you're probably wondering if I use Shipping Reptiles or Reptile Express or, you know, how I do it, you know, do I use FedEx or whatever. Um, so the, the answer with that is, I, like I said, I live in central Wisconsin. I live in the Wassa area. Uh, which is where Garrick DeMeyer from Little Constructor Designs is located. Uh, so as far as shipping goes, because I have 100% faith in how Garrick ships his animals and how he, uh, he he does it all the time on a regular basis and he runs his business off of it, I typically actually go to his place and ship my reptiles through him. So he basically creates the label, um, tells me how much I owe for shipping that snake or that package, and then I pay him. <laughs> so, I mean, that's that's basically what I do. I, I'm re I'll, I'll admit I'm really lucky as far as that goes um, because he is so experienced in doing that and I have 100% faith that the reptiles I'm going to get from here to whoever ends up purchasing from me. So if you buy reptiles from me, more than likely the, pa the package is going to come in the mail. It's going to have Garrick DeMeyer's uh, name on it because it it goes, from, goes through him. So, um, But it is FedEx overnight delivery, so... Um, but I would say I have used Shippy Reptiles before in the past also if Garrick wasn't shipping or something like that I would just sh go through Shippy Reptiles um, and I, that was fine too so uh, next question Dave M asks do you enjoy watching sports if so what sports are your favorite and which teams do you root for uh, yes so I'm a huge uh, football fan I do the fantasy football thing um, but my favorite team is the Green Bay Packers. And again, I am from Wisconsin. So the Green Bay Packers are my team. They've always been my team. Um, it's not because they've had two really great quarterbacks for the last two decades um, or anything like that. Uh, if they started to really, really suck, which they might now because Aaron Rodgers is out for the season, it sounds like. Um, for anyways, for this year, I'm still going to back the Packers. So... Um, also, being from Wisconsin, I, I follow the Badgers somewhat for uh, Badger football for college. Um, I don't watch a lot of NBA or basketball. I like to play basketball, but I don't really like to watch it. Um, not on TV anyways. Um, but, you know, I, I really don't say I wouldn't say I have an NBA team. I really am the Bucks, I guess. But I don't even really know who plays in all the teams. Um, baseball, I, I kind of watch the Brewers, follow the Brewers. Uh, Milwaukee Brewers, and then also the Atlanta Braves, because uh, when I grew up as a kid, um, for some reason I gravitated gravitated towards the Atlanta Braves for some reason. Um, right before they start, I think they won a World Series in the late '90s, somewhere mid to late '90s. It was right before all that um, I started liking the Braves. Um, I think it was some promotion. Uh, I got a bunch of Atlanta Braves cards through like some cereal box promotion back in the day, and I think that's kind of why I started liking the Braves for some reason. Stupid reason, but it is what it is, I guess. Um, so, yeah, that'd be pretty much that. And then um, Wisconsin doesn't have a hockey team, a professional hockey team. I like to catch hockey every so often. Uh, so I like watching it. But I think it's really, really weird that Wisconsin is surrounded by all these other states and providences that have hockey teams. And we are in the cold, wintry season, you know, when it's winter time, and we don't have a hockey team. It's just really weird. But then there's California and Florida and Texas. They all have hockey teams. So it is what it is, I guess. But that's my little rant on sports. <laughs> uh, next up, Brandon Crow asked, about a year ago or so, you mentioned that you had to sell quite a bit of your collection. How was that experience, and how's your collection now compared to before? So what happened is I lost a, my – I have been working at my current job now for almost four years. It'll be four years in January. Prior to that – um, I had been working at a job um, where I was a route manager for a company, and I was a route manager for a couple of years, and when, when I was working at that company, I had started to get into the ball pythons, and I had started a collection, um, and when I lost that job, and I, 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 I had mentioned prior in this video that I have two boys with my ex-wife, well, I have to pay child support on those kids. 
and um, and at the time I was paying like six hundred and fifty dollars a month or so on ch in child support. So because of that, um, I started getting behind because I my unemployment that I was getting while I was trying to find a job was barely anything, and I needed to support my family. I had my daughter had just been born the previous August, so in less than a year after she was born, I had lost my job. Uh, you know, I still have bills to pay, you know, rent and car payments and electric bill, water bill, um, you know, we had to buy food and stuff. My wife was working, but she, um, you know, she wasn't making as much income as I was making. So it was really hard on us. And, and because of that, I had to sell a lot of my ball python stuff that I was holding back is when I had to start selling it. And what sucked is I had to start selling the stuff that I really wanted to keep that was worth the most because I needed to pay the bills. So I would sell like my pastel pied female that I produced and she was so awesome. I ended up selling her and I had to pay the rent with it. Um, I had to sell, you know, I, I had like a butter, and I had a lot of single gene stuff. So um, I had like a butter, um, sugar, uh, albino, fire, uh, what else did I have? Champagne. So I had a lot of single gene stuff and I had the foods, um, you know, double gene and, and multiple gene stuff too. Like I had... Um, you know, Lemon Blast and Bumblebee and a lot of that kind of stuff. Uh, I got where I was all the way down to the last four animals in my collection. That And then I finally and I got this job. I was able to stop selling the stuff and kind of start rebuilding. Um, the animals I still had left in my collection were my Killer Blast female that I had produced by breeding my Bumblebee to my Lemon Blast back in 2012. Um, so I had that Killer Blast, which again was super pastel, pinstripe spider female. Uh, I also have my pastel ivory, um, which I had purchased a couple years prior to that. Uh, and I, I just was looking at the potential. I'm like, out of all the snakes I had still left, she was like, I, I can do the, the highway stuff. is starting to kind of come around around that time. And uh, super striped stuff is already popular and puma stuff. So I'm like, I really wanted to keep that pastel ivory. Um, she was in, a, it was a take kind of a lot for her to have to go. Um, and then I also kept... Um, when I used to have my piebald, I, I had to sell her as well. Um, I sold my piebald but kept her babies, which she was bred by the pastel clown. So I kept uh, the pastel clown, I'm sorry, pastel 100% het clown and piebald. So again, um, pastel, I guess double het, uh, double het clown pied, that was the male, and then the, the female was just a normal double het clown pied. So then from that point, I was able to kind of start rebuilding. And um, I think it was 2014. And when you start watching like videos, if you go back into 2014, um, then I started getting, I got like the Soul Sucker Female, the Pastel, Mystic Potion, um, started getting some of the other stuff at that point. Um, in 2015, I started getting the Desert Ghost stuff. So, um, or actually it was that last year, yeah, last year, actually 2016, is when I started getting the, the, um, the Desert Ghost stuff. So um, I've really been rebuilt back up from that point. And it was it was hard. It was really hard. And, and it was really hard seeing stuff go that I didn't want to sell. So um, and if anybody has ever gone through that, you you know. Um, if you haven't gone through that, I hope you don't have to, um, especially if you love it and want to stay doing it. It's just, it's really hard. Um, but... It's something I don't ever want to go through again. So fingers crossed, pray to God that I don't lose this job because it really, um, I know I know the first thing that would have to go would be some of these snakes and I, I don't want to have that happen. Um, but I'd say my collection now is like 10 times better than it was before. Uh, when I rebuilt my collection, what I tried to do was figure out, okay, if I would have still had my collection from before and would have been breeding stuff, uh, what would I have made? And I kind of went more so like, okay, I would have made a pastel mystic potion with the Mojave that I had as a pair of the pastel mystic with the Mojave at one point in time. Okay, so instead of just going back out and getting another Mojave and another pastel mystic, I saved up a little extra money and got a pastel mystic potion. Um, so I, I, I ramped up a lot of my, a lot of my snakes now can't even produce normals because they're supers or act like supers or they're, they're visual recessives or, or a lot, you know the odds of them producing normals are a lot more slim. I mean, I can produce normals, but I have a lot less animals that can do that now. Um, so I would say my collection's a lot better now than it was before. Um, when you compare that time period with this time period. Um, 
Exquisite Exotics asks, what animal would you keep as a pet if you could have any animal? So what animal would I keep as a pet if I could have any animal? Um, as much as I love the reptiles and stuff, if I could have one single pet to have as a pet, one animal to have as a pet, it'd be a toucan. I think toucans are so awesome. Um, there's this one YouTube channel. Um, I don't know if she still has um, stuff on there, but it was... Um, uh, if I think about what it is, I'll put a link below. But this lady's got this toucan uh, named Rocky or Rocco or something like that. And this toucan is so awesome. And she's got a few toucans, actually. And I'm not sure where she lives, but I don't know if I'd be able to do it up here. I'd have to have a pretty big space um, because I think hers stay outside. I think she's down in, like, the Florida area or maybe she's not even in America. But um, those toucans are so cool. I would love to have a toucan. Um, I think that'd be a pretty cool animal to have. Um, Next up from MT Universe, what's your favorite movie, video game, and musician? So, uh, movie, I would have to say my favorite movie of all time. I'd probably have to go with Ghostbusters. As a kid, I watched Ghostbusters. I had like all the Ghostbuster toys. Um, to this day, I could still watch Ghostbusters and enjoy it. Um, my kids like Ghostbusters now because me, even my daughter, she likes Ghostbusters. Um, I don't know. It was just a, to me, it was a classic and um, a lot, you know, still a lot of fun to watch and stuff. Um, but um, other ones like from, you know, I would say all-time favorite, like Dumb and Dumber was hilarious. I can still watch that movie and laugh so hard. Um, movies nowadays, I mean, I I kind of go, you know, my current favorite. I mean, I, I'm not really sure about my current, but I know I like when Guardians of the Galaxy came out. I really liked that one. I thought it was really good. I had no clue what Guardians of the Galaxy was until the movie came out. Um, liked it a lot. So uh, I, I guess my movie favorites have changed you know here and there all the time uh video games um recently uh me and the boys uh played that video game called until dawn um on the playstation 4 so that was pretty interesting because it was like a tv show that played out based on your decisions so uh, it was actually a lot of fun um wasn't really sure how that was going to be because i thought you know a lot of like the time base you you have to press a button within so much time or something else would happen and stuff like that and um it was always a lot of fun um otherwise i like the tomb raider games like the newer tomb raider games that came out um probably my favorite video game of all time is probably still super mario 64 for the nintendo 64 so i was born in 1982 and so i grew up in the 90s when there was like super nintendo genesis and then like the playstation and the nintendo 64 all came out those, so I so I, I have a lot of fond memories of those video games, and the first time I ever played Super Mario 64, I just thought it was the most groundbreaking thing I had ever played. Um, some of my viewers now might, you know, you probably grew up knowing what analog controls were, you know, since you were you know little and stuff. But um, that was the first time we, um, us in the 90s had ever dealt with an analog controller. Uh, no, it was, it was just digital buttons, left, right, up, down. Um, so that was really cool, and I think that's probably my favorite video game of all time um, because of how different it was and the memories I have with that game. Um, musician? I'd probably have to say uh, overall Corey Taylor. Uh, he's the lead singer of Slipknot and Stone Sour. Um, I think he's just got such a wide range of what he can, can and can't do. Uh, man, he's like... Um, I shouldn't say can't do because he can, he can sing like really awesome lyrics but he can also do the screaming stuff um and some like the Slipknot and stone sour songs um but because i dj i have a huge array of listening um preferences i like rock country rap hip-hop top 40 stuff classic stuff like 80s like pop music 80s rock music 70s disco oldies i mean i can pretty much listen to anything like I said, I used to DJ. I can even listen to polkas, not for a long time, but I can kind of listen to them a little bit. Um, so I, there's a lot of different things I listen to. Um, yeah, with the kids and stuff, I, it kind of expands into whatever they're listening to also now. So, um, yeah, a lot of different kinds of music and stuff. Um, next question. DJ Skullball Pythons 1. He is one of my Patreons, also one of my patrons, so a big shout out to him. Um, and thank you for uh, commenting on here as well. Um, what specific gene do you work with more than others, and how big do you plan on growing? Um, so I would say, based on my pairings this year, I would say the Desert Ghost gene is what I'm working with the most. However, if you look at every single snake in my collection, and um, 
I think see here. Maybe I didn't answer that question. Um, so I have 36 snakes. I currently have 36 snakes. And um, if you were to look at every single snake and what Gene and I work with the most, it would basically look like I work with pastel the most because 17 of my animals have pastel in it. So, um, so yeah, 17. I actually went and counted. I had to write a number down so I wouldn't forget. I didn't realize I had that many snakes with pastel in them. But um, I think a lot of collections probably have pastel because it seems like that's the one gene that when you first start working with a project, you kind of want to get pastel in it because it usually adjusts the color so much. You have a normal looking snake, then you throw pastel in it and it changes it up pretty drastically for the most part. So, um, so yeah, that's, again, this right here, super pastel, Desert Ghost. So everything she produces is going to be pastel at minimum. It'll also be 100% Desert Ghost. So um, if I just bred her to a normal, I'd be getting pastel at Desert Ghost. So yeah, pastel seems to be the biggest one that I have. Um, but as far as my actual breeding goes, it, I'm trying to work a lot with the Desert Ghost stuff. I'd like to get that into almost everything I can get my hands onto. Um, because like I said, I think that it just, it makes everything better. You would have an awesome looking snake as a baby, as it grows older, it dulls up a little bit. This desert ghost gene, it, it keeps it fresh. It keeps it clean looking, um, vibrant, you know? Um, so, it, so again, DJ skull ball, um, DJ skull ball pythons one. Uh, so thanks for asking that question. And again, that's one of my patrons. So we get a little extra shout out on this one. So thank you very much for supporting me on Patreon.com also. Um, next question, uh, Larry Dutro, um, and he had asked, um, I had mentioned this a little earlier, when he asked what was the first morph of ball python you had, uh, that you had, and that had you hooked, sorry, that had you hooked that you wanted to produce for the first clutch. Um, and then also he asked what moment was it, or what particular species got you into snakes? So this is where I'm going to kind of elaborate on the history of Pacific reptiles. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, I was deathly afraid of snakes. And what had gotten me into, uh, into even getting near the possibility of having a snake was um, my son. Well, I, technically he's my stepson, but I look at him as my son. He, I've been raising him since he was seven years old with my, my wife. Uh, again, he was the one that, um, um, my wife's son that, from a previous relationship so when he was seven years old this is within the first a uh, little over a year after I had met my my wife um, at the time we were dating and living together and she told me that he wanted to bring a snake home from the school forest it was a fire belly or red belly or whatever that's called uh, that's native native up here in Wisconsin and he goes she's like well can he uh, you know he wants to keep it as a pet and, I, and my, I'm not kidding you, my exact words were, no, no way, I will never have a snake in this house. I hate snakes. I do not want snakes. I'm deathly afraid of them. I don't, I don't want a snake in here. And, and I'm not kidding you. I, I remember that it was like yesterday because, because of the situation I'm in now. Yeah. Um, and I guess I can be kind of a spokesperson for people who, um, should give snakes a chance that, that, um probably haven't yet because I was 27 years old when that specific instance happened. 27 years old, I would said, no way I'm ever having a snake. I do not want a snake in this house. There will never be a snake in this house as far as I'm around or as long as I'm around. And uh, when he got home, he took a little jar that it was in and it looked like the same kind of jars, like a mason jar that you would catch and put caterpillars and stuff like that because the snake was so small. It was like the size of a earthworm. And uh, he goes, can you just hold it, please? And I looked at it, and I think my thoughts were, well, it's pretty small. I don't think it will hurt that bad if it does bite me. And I think that might be where I was the most afraid. I, was, I think I was afraid that it was going to bite me. And I held on to this snake, and I kind of screamed, and I was like, oh, it kind of gave me the willies a little bit. But I'm like, well, it's not as bad as I thought it was going to be. And he was kind of moving around in my hand. I said, you know what, tell you what, I guess we'll get you, we'll get you a cage tomorrow. At Petco, we'll go to Petco, we'll get you a cage, and then um, I just want to let you know that if that thing ever gets out, anything ever happens to it, it's done, it's it. No more snakes, you're not getting anything. And uh, so the next day, we go to Petco, and I tell the lady, 
hey, we need to get a tank for a snake. We don't. I had no clue how to raise a snake. I had no idea about anything about snakes. And I said, you know, I didn't know anything about it. <laughs> so she goes, well, what kind is it? I said, it's a fire belly or red belly or whatever. And she goes, oh, you don't want those because they they are hard to keep alive in wintertime because they eat larvae and bugs and stuff. And it's hard to kind of get them in this area in the wintertime. I'm like, oh, okay. She's like, well, we do have ball pythons and boas. I'm like, yeah, I don't know about that, though. I said, well, I don't know. I guess I'll look at them. I don't think we'll get one, though. And she's like, well, the ball pythons are, are pretty snappy. Um, you know, they're really nippy and stuff and um, kind of kind of aggressive. I'm like, oh, well, definitely not a ball python. And I don't want anything to do with ball pythons if they're aggressive. And again, keep in mind, I had no idea about anything of snakes. So this is just based on what the lady at Petco told me. And um, she pulls out a boa constrictor. And this boa constrictor was probably a little bit smaller. I mean, it was a lot smaller than this body-wise. But at length-wise, I would say it was probably about like, you know, 18 inches long or so and uh she's holding on to it and she goes do you want to hold it and at that point my knees are shaking my knees are really shaking I was like oh my gosh I really don't want in my head I was thinking I don't want to hold on to the snake but I also don't want her to know that I'm afraid of it because I don't think she'll sell it to us if we decide we want to get it so I was looking at how it was in her hands and it was basically the same as what this snake is doing right now it's kind of moving through my hands you know I mean, it was this one's actually not as active. Boas are a little more active than ball pythons are, but um, it but it was moving through her hands, and she I I walked over there, hesitant, very hesitant to walk over there, but I walked over there. She put it in my hands and it started moving through my hands, and I was like, "Oh my gosh, this is awesome!" Twenty seven years old, the first time I ever held a snake that was bigger than well, actually the first time I held a snake ever, um, besides that fire belly the other night in my palm. Um, but yeah, I was like, oh my gosh, this is awesome. I said, yeah, I think we're going to buy this. I said, this is really cool. I had never held a snake before. So we bought the cage, we bought the snake, bought all the stuff, asked her what to get. Um, of course she recommended a heat rock, which we did not get. Thank God. Cause there's a horror stories about that. If you're watching this and you're not very familiar with snakes, never, ever, ever buy a heat rock for your snake ever. Um, but yeah, she recommended that, but we, we got the heat lamp. We said, what's the, what's the bare minimum for now? Because we had to get some of the stuff with our next paycheck. So, um, so yeah, we ended up buying the stuff. Got the cage all set up at home. We brought home the little the little uh, cardboard box that they gave you at Petco. And she had the snake. It, they put the snake in there. We get it home and, and the tank is all set up, the terrarium. Uh, we bought a 40-gallon breeder. Again, it was a smaller bow at the time, so she wasn't full grown yet. And, uh, and my wife and I are looking at it, got everything in there. I'm like, oh, what if the thing's mad? What if it's mad that we're, I mean, you know, it's been in this box for the last couple of hours while we were getting stuff and setting up the cage and stuff? I was like, what if it's mad, you know, and it strikes at me as soon as I open the box? And my wife's like, do you want me to do it? And I'm like, no, 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 I'll do it, I'll do it. So I, I opened the box, I grabbed the snake out, it was like this. Like, as fast as I could, I put <laughs> I put the snake in the in the terrarium, closed the cover, and I'm like, okay, well, we probably should leave it so it doesn't get mad. Um, again, that was my first experience with, with snakes at all, so... Um, that's how that's how I got started into snakes. Uh, my wife came back and said, "Hey, um, somebody said this guy named Garrett Demeyer um, is kind of like this local snake expert. He's got a whole bunch of snakes and he breeds them or something. So if we have any questions, we can probably get a hold of him. And he's on a website. I'm like, cool. Let's go to it. I was that night. Starting that night, I just started researching the crap out of everything. I was researching like almost as long as I wasn't working, I was researching snakes, ball pythons, boas." Um, more so boas at the time because again I only had the boa and um, when I got the website for Garrick's RoyalConstrictorDesigns.com I went on there and I saw a killer clown ball python and I was like oh my gosh this is so awesome the snakes at the at Petco it didn't look like that and that killer clown ball python was just amazing and I was like okay and this is 2009 this is the first year he hatched the killer clown ball python he had hatched a killer clown ball python and a pastel clown ball python and he had a picture of the two next to each other but he also had a picture of the killer clown by itself and i was like that is just some amazing looking snake i can't believe there's colorations like that and i didn't know about morphs or anything at the time so his number was on the card that my wife gave me and um or written down in the paper or whatever and then also his number was on the website so i called him up and i said hey uh garrick uh, my name is doug um you just got a boa constrictor and um 
I was on your website, and I was looking, at I see you have this ball python. I didn't know they looked like that. I said, I was wondering about buying that. And um, he goes, well, if you're just getting into it, so I probably wouldn't buy a, a killer clown ball python. And I was like, oh, okay, why is that? I didn't know if maybe there was, you know, the lady at Petco said they were kind of mean, so maybe that was the reason why. And I asked him that. He's like, no, no, that's not, that's not the reason. He's like, right now, if you were going to buy a killer clown ball python, uh, they sell for about $12,000 right now. I'm like, oh my gosh, $12,000? I just bought a red tail boa for $125, and that was on sale. And I'm like, holy crap, Like $12,000 That's more than my car is worth. I was like, okay, I guess I won't be getting that anytime soon. Um, so at that point, he's like, well, he's like, what I could tell you to do is that he's, he had an open house. So I went to his open house, I talked to him more, but um, I talked to him on the phone, and he said what you could do is take the genetics that you would be able to make a killer clown with, take those together and then breed them and then whatever whatever babies you don't want to keep, you can sell those, help pay for your rats, help pay for your electric, help pay for your, you're basically help pay, it helps cover the costs of having the hobby in the first place. So I said, that would be a great idea. And then he's like, well, I have other stuff on there. Just feel free to take a look at my website and if you have any questions and stuff, you know, and you want to see something, you can always, call me and then maybe schedule a time to come over to the shop. Um, his shop's not open to the public. You can't just go to his shop 20, you know, like during business hours. He, he it's a breeding facility. So anyways, and he is also having an open house. I started looking and I'm like, Oh my gosh, watch his YouTube videos. And I saw the bumblebees and I'm like, man, the bumblebees just, Holy crap. That is awesome. It's yellow and black. It's amazing. And I saw on his website, he had some bumblebees available and they were selling for $750 at the time. So in 2009, a bumblebee was 750 bucks for a female. And he said that he'd recommend to go with females first because it takes them longer to get up to breeding size and then males you can get later. So that's how I kind of planned it. But I watched a video called Killer Blast, like rare Killer Blast um, that he has up. And so again, I mentioned this a few times, but Killer Blast is a super pastel pinstripe spider. So that... That more if I wanted to make because it looked really awesome, and plus I wanted a bumblebee, so I'm like, well, I can make killer blast if I get a bumblebee and a lemon blast. So that was, that was kind of um, let me see, I find out where that was actually. Yeah, the question was that. So that was the first more for ball python that I that kind of got me hooked. Killer clown got me hooked, um, but the first one I wanted to produce was a killer blast because I didn't, I wasn't able to afford the stuff for get for making killer clowns and stuff at that point in time. So, um, but otherwise killer clown still, I, I still have not yet produced a killer clown ever. So when I do that, eventually my bucket list will have a little notch crossed off of it for producing a killer clown. Um, but I did produce a killer blast and I still have the female that I produced from that clutch to this day. And she's laid two good clutches for me so far. Um, so hopefully she does good for me this year. I have some big plans for her this year. So, um, all right, so, um, and that was the moment that got me into the particular species of snakes as well. So I kind of covered that whole entire story. That's that, that right there is your, your um, as far back history as hissy fit reptiles will go. Um, so that's how it all started. That's how I got over my fear of snakes. Um, Larry Dutro also asked, how do you feel about the sunset gene and do you want to work with it yourself? Uh, yes, I do like the sunset gene and I do want to work with it. And as you probably can guess, some desert ghosts in the sunset i think that thing is gonna pop um i don't know if you've seen sunsets as they get older but they do dull quite a bit um they still are a red color but it's like a it's like a dirty red color um as babies it's kind of got that really cool um I, it's hard to describe that coloration but i think if you get desert ghosts into any sunset project i think it's gonna be amazing and on top of that it will be a double recessive project so um so sunsets are recessive and so are desert ghosts so yes i'd like to work with the sunsets eventually Spartan Reptiles asks, what future projects do you yourself, uh, see yourself working with in the future and why? Um, so I mentioned Sunset. So eventually I'd like to work with Sunset. Um, um, I'll be honest, Mahogany. And that's um, something I could probably get now if I really wanted to or even trade into, my, into the Mahogany um, stuff. But I really want to get uh, Mahogany. Um, I don't know if you, if you haven't seen already. Um, Ashley Berg on Facebook. Um, I can't remember what her... Um, or business is called or whatever, but 
she had produced a GHI Super Mahogany, and that's the blackest snake I've ever seen in my entire life, and it's just all black. Uh, that thing is amazing, and I keep thinking to myself how awesome that would be to get piebald into that, because Super Mahogany's don't have the issues as black, like the same issues that black pastels and cinnamons do with the Super Forms. So Super Forms of cinnamons and black pastels and a combo of the two together, sometimes they get like the duck billing, and sometimes they get kinking in there as well. Um, the Super Mahogany's don't have that. And when you throw GHI in with it, if you can produce a GHI Super Mahogany, also known as Suma, um, and Piebald together, I think that's just going to be like the new standard for uh, Panda Pides. I don't know if they'd still call them Panda Pides, but it'd basically be your Piebald with black spots all over. It'd be awesome. So that I'd like to do as well. Um, also getting to like double recessive and triple recessive stuff. I think that's going to be kind of like the future of the of the business. I think that um, as a lot of these single genes still continue to drop in price, um, the value I think is going to maintain in triple, double and triple recessive animals because of the rarity of them. So I think like triple recessive, let's say you produced an, like a desert ghost clown piebald, that would probably be worth a lot of money for years to come because... Um, and that would help keep the hobby where people are just still going to want to strive for something. you got to strive for something. If you're striving just to make bumblebees every year, then you're, you're, you know, you're, you'll be able to do that and you can do it all the time. But if you want to like advance your projects and advance where you want to go in the industry, um, industry or hobby, however you consider it, um, you really got to keep thinking bigger and bigger and bigger every year as far as you produce. Maybe you keep the same amount of animals every year. Maybe you, you replace you know, sort, you know, you get het female, let's say you have like five het clowns. Well, you, eventually you probably want to replace them with visual clowns. So that way you're not just gambling on hets every year. Um, so I, I think that double recessive and triple recessives are going to be huge, um, more so than they are now. All right. And you know, triple recessives, I don't know if there's even been a triple recessive visual animal produced yet. Um, but then, um, also scaleless. Um, I think that I want to kind of wait a little bit to see how the whole scaleless thing plays out. Um, if anything, I'd probably still at least want to have one scaleless snake, even if it was just one. Um, you know, like maybe make a female or something. Like, you don't know, get a female scaleless to see. But um, again, I kind of want to wait till I see how it plays out. Um, Cypress as well. Cypress is going to be pretty huge, and there's some other uh, neat genes coming out. I think one's called like Hurricane or something like that. Or. Um, Tsunami or side hammer. There are some really cool genes out there that I um, Look into work with also. I have the surge gene that only me and Fred kick have right now and That gene I think is gonna be pretty interesting to work with so I'll be working with that uh, She won't be ready to breed this year. It's a super super pastel surge yellow belly um, But you know, she's pretty awesome. Uh, I should bring her out right now. Just to kind of show you she's kind of she's kind of uh, finicky but but she's pretty awesome looking. Looks a lot different than a regular Super Pastel Yellow Belly. So this is the Super Pastel Surge Yellow Belly. Got some really interesting coloration and blushing going on. More so than regular Super Pastel Yellow Belly. So and that's caused by the Surge gene. So I think if you get Desert Ghost into this too, Again, probably pretty awesome. Um, so, next up on the question list here, um, DEA Exotics asks, where do you see the ball python market in, let's say, 10 years, and where are you taking your collection? So I kind of covered that in this last question. I think in the next 10 years, you're going to be seeing people working with, trying to get triple recessives, double recessives of things. Um, you know, the sun, you know, a sunset desert ghost piebald or, um, you know, I think if you get desert ghost into it, nice thing is, is it doesn't take away from the animal. It adds to it. Um, where, you know, if you get something into albino, you know, you almost got to have pied and then like you can barely tell what else is in it, you know, unless it's a pattern, a complete pattern type thing. But um, I think that in the future for myself as well, I think I'm going to keep on, you know, trying to get desert ghosts into things, how awesome it looks. Um, and I'm not going to put desert ghosts into everything. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that desert ghost is my only gene I'm going to work with, but I mean, um, as like a, as a base for my snakes, but 
you know, I'm hoping to get clown stuff, super orange dream stuff. Um, again, I wouldn't mind getting into the cypress stuff. Um, a mixture of, you know, different jeans that maybe are untapped, like red stripes, see how some of that stuff might go. So that's kind of what I see um, for the, right, me taking my collection and stuff. And for the next 10 years, I think, uh, you know, you're going to continue, I think you're going to see the prices of things still kind of decline. Um, but that happens with everything. I mean, everything declines and, you know, new stuff comes out and old stuff gets replaced. But the thing is, is like, you can still do so much with the old stuff by putting new stuff to it. So when a new gene comes out, well, then pastel's relevant again because you want to put the pastel with that new gene. And yellow belly is still relevant, even though yellow bellies by themselves are like around 50 bucks a piece right now. 35 even I've seen them as low as. So even though you can do some amazing stuff with yellow belly, like making highways and and pumas and super stripes and stuff like that and even an ivory is still an awesome animal um you know it's such an underrated gene because you can do so much with it and then whenever a new gene comes out you have a whole plethora of genes that no matter how much they're worth you know a big amount or a little amount you can still do so much stuff with them so i think that um this this industry and this hobby is always kind of moving along with what's coming out and there's always it's weird that there's always new genes coming out I and mean, who would think that there's this many single gene animals in the wild that people have caught um so um yeah next up dark science reptiles yes would you ever breed other species of snakes and if so what uh yes i definitely would like to eventually get into boas um as far i don't know if i want to go a huge breeding project on boas but I would left in like a couple different boa morphs and maybe breed a few of them together. Um, blood pythons, there's some really cool looking blood pythons out there. I wouldn't mind getting a few blood pythons. Um, Hognose, wouldn't mind getting into Hognose um, projects. Carpet pythons, that'd be another one I'd like to probably get, maybe get into. Um, and green tree pythons, I think those are really awesome too. Even it's just as a display animal, even if I only had a compare or something to make, um, you know, a few green tree pythons every year or something to be really cool. Um, so yes, I would definitely like to eventually do that. Um, Graze reptiles. I'm just gonna put you a, a shout out on that because you asked the same questions as going going Uper, and I was actually gonna mention uh, you in that in that comment or in that question. Uh, Gray from Graze reptiles, um, but I'm still gonna do a little shout out for for throwing a question down anyway. So thanks, Gray, for uh, putting the question down, and hopefully I answered that, you know, um, for you. Um, only got a couple more questions left. Eddie Bricks asked. How does your wife and daughter feel about all the snakes and do they share your passion for them? Uh, he also mentions that his children love the snakes, but his wife is scared of them. Okay, so my wife is not scared of them, but she hates them. She cannot stand that I do this. She hates it to the bitter end. Um, multiple times a year, she tells me she wants me to sell everything, get rid of everything. And I told her, well, I, I can do that. I can get rid of everything right now. I can make whatever money you want me to have. I said, or I can keep them and I can breed stuff and I can... You know, sell some of the stuff I don't want, keep the stuff I and make better projects and stuff like that. Um, like I said, for me, it's still a hobby, but if I make money on it, it kind of keeps her off my back, which is also why I kind of do the Patreon thing. Um, right now, I'm doing this video because she's not here. She's at work. So she is nowhere around here, and that's why I'm able to do this video. If she's home right now, I can do the video, but we're going to get a fight. You know, I, I, I'm not going not gonna to sugarcoat it. She hates it. She thinks it's stupid. She thinks it's stupid that people wouldn't want to watch my stuff. Um, she can't believe it that people watch my videos. Uh, the patrons that have supported me and, and like pledged money, she can't believe anybody would want to put money towards watching me. Um, again, the Patreon thing isn't isn't paying for his favorite reptiles to exist. It's for me to be able to do this more often because for her, it is all about the money. And, and that's what sucks for me is I'm kind of caught in the middle. I, I, I want to do this just as a passion. Um, and, you know, and yeah, I make some extra money from breeding and stuff like that. But when she gets on my case for making videos for you guys to watch and she doesn't like that I'm spending time doing this when I should be spending time with her or my family. And, I mean, I work a lot of overtime at my work just so I can pay for my rats and pay for, you know, oh, hey, I have to buy, no, I have to buy like another couple hundred rats to feed my snakes so now I gotta work a bunch of overtime, which takes time away from my family the way it is. And now all of a sudden, I wanna do a video for you guys and she just thinks it's stupid. 
and then we get in a fight, argument about it. She wants me to sell everything if I don't have, you know, she threat. Uh, here's an example. A couple of years ago, she said that if I didn't make at least whatever much money that I had to sell everything. Um, and I'm like, that's, that's, uh, unrealistic. I said, I, I don't know what I'm going to produce. I said, I could produce all normals, <laughs> you know? It'd be one thing if I knew what I wanted, you know, knew what I had, if I had a bigger, you know, following, a bigger anything. I it just, it's really, it's really hard for me to have to deal with that. And I do, I love her and I love my family. I love my kids. My daughter loves this stuff. My daughter wants to come in here all the time and hold snakes and stuff. She loves that I have snakes and she's a huge animal person. My wife doesn't even really like animals in general. We have a dog. We have a miniature schnauzer dog and she doesn't really care for her that much. So... She likes animals initially, but then she wears, she wears, um, like, she is sick of them really fast. Um, she liked the snakes when we first got them, but then as I started doing it as a hobby and breeding them and stuff, she told me right out her space, her exact words were, you're never going to be Garrick DeMeyer. I said, I'm not trying to be Garrick DeMeyer. I'm trying to be Doug. I'm trying to be Doug here at Hissy Fit Reptiles, doing these videos for you guys, breeding the snakes I want to breed. I'm, I breed what I, I breed, I breed for myself to make what I want to make. And then you guys get the benefit off of the ones I don't want to make or don't end up keeping. I, I make some, a, bunch, a lot of the animals I, I produce, I want to keep all of them. But, you know, if I did that, then I just have a whole bunch more snakes. And then, you know, how am I supposed to feed them and stuff? So uh, the Patreon thing, support me, you know, people pledge money. And I'm going to reward these people for pledging money to me. So if you, if you pledge money to me, you're going to be rewarded uh, by, again... I'm actually, you know, I might even end up changing it a little bit. So right now, anybody who pledges anything to me on Patreon, you get 10% off anything you buy from me ever. As long as you're a current pledging member or patron on my Patreon page, you're getting 10% off. Um, I think once I get to like 500 to to $1,000 a month, I think I'm going to do free shipping for everybody who is a patron member. So if, you're a, if, you're, if you buy a $50 snake, then you'll just pay $50 and you're going to get it shipped to you. Um, which is basically, I'm not making money on it, but because the patron pledges are, are kind of covering that stuff for me, it affords me to be able to do certain stuff like that. And nobody else I think is doing something, anything like that. Um, also, um, as I mentioned in previous videos, if I get up to a certain amount of pledges, right, let's say I get like around a thousand dollars a month, I'm going to start giving away snakes for free every single month to my uh, patron um, members. So, uh, if you're a patron to my Patreon page, again, that's patreon.com slash hissyfitreptiles, then you're going to have a chance to win snakes like this. Because eventually, um, if I get like, tw if I get $10,000 a month, I'd be able to give a, I'd be able to do, tw I'm going to do 25% of whatever I make in a month from my pledges. So if I make $10,000, which is, that's a long way away, and I don't know if it will ever, ever happen, but if it ever did happen, if I was getting ten thousand dollars a month from my pledges, I would, I would be giving away a twenty five hundred dollars snake. Um, this right here is only worth, I think, super pastel desert ghosts are only worth like twelve hundred now. So I mean, you'd be getting something even better than this, as a free snake. I mean, that's awesome, and I don't think anybody is doing that, not that much, and I'd be doing it every month. So if you're a patron. So, you know, hang out, hang tight with me as far as everything goes because I think uh, eventually it's going to be pretty awesome. Um, so, my wife, again, sorry, I really went off on a tangent on that one. Um, and I had to check the time to see <laughs> what time it was here. But um, my, my wife hates it. She can't stand it. And that's why um, I asked for the support I asked for um, to do these videos. And I would like to put more videos up for you guys. I enjoy doing them and I enjoy seeing you guys comment on them and liking it and watching it and all that kind of stuff. So um, I, I don't do my videos for me to watch. I, I can just come in here and look at my stuff anytime I want. This is for you guys and uh, and I appreciate you guys' support. I appreciate you guys following me. Um, you know, Even when I don't have stuff to sell, you're watching my videos, you're watching my collection updates, which I hopefully will have a collection update for you guys sometime in the near future. So um, stay tuned for that. I would like to get one up here within the next month or so. Um, uh, so HBP asks, other than the desert ghost gene, what other, um, what's another favorite gene? 
Um, so I'm, that would be clown. I love the clown gene. I think that'd be my next favorite be clown because of the combos that you can do with clowns are so awesome. Um, so I'd say the clown gene is my next favorite besides desert ghost. Um, and, and what's what I plan on working a lot with. Um, how many ball pythons do you currently have? Okay, so that was the question I, I actually kind of already answered earlier. I have 36 ball pythons in my collection now. That's not including the ones I have for sale. So as far as what I have in my actual collection for future breeding projects and like um, stuff like that, 36. Um, that includes what I just picked up from Tinley and all that kind of stuff. So um, uh, next part of the question, what's the highest number of snakes you will go before you can't have any more? Um, if you ask my wife, the answer would be like one. <laughs> um, she's already not happy that I have this many, and anytime I get more snakes, she is really not happy. So um, even if I use the money from selling uh, other snakes to you know, like or when I did a trade, I did a trade with Fred Kick. He got a soul sucker female um, from me, and I did the trade where I got the super pastel Surge Yellow Belly. She was very upset that. I didn't get money for it, and I did a trade instead. But that's that's what it is, and that's how she is. That's that's her. That's what I got to deal with with her. For me, I would much rather have had the snake. So, so yeah. Sorry, she just knocked the skill down here just now. But but I would say for me myself personally, I would say probably between one hundred to two hundred would be pretty. I think I'd be to the point where it's not super huge but at the same time i could you know i could still manage it all by myself um even with my job but if it got to be where i was you know able to support myself and the family on um, whatever i made from that see maybe about cutting down hours or maybe getting a different job so i can still have a job with insurance and stuff like that but yeah that, that'd be my answer for that um and then the last part of that question from hbp do you prefer coconut bedding um, or paper for a substrate. Uh, I hate paper. I, I've had paper in there a few times. It's, I hate when I open the tub and I see these snakes trying to slither on paper and they can't go anywhere. That's why I don't like paper. Um, if I had to do, if I was, you know, a paper towel, I, at least they have a little more traction, it seems like. But I like the substrate, like coconut husk. Um, I used to use cypress mulch and aspen bedding. I, I like all that more than paper. I use paper in like a, like let's say let's say it's a male and they have like a, a ruptured hemipene. I'll take all the substrate out and then I'll put paper down for uh, you know while I'm trying to medicate the snake and stuff like that. So um, if in that in that situation, I'll use paper, but I will not use paper for regular substrate. Um, I know you can just basically take it out, and clean it, put new paper in. But I, I'd rather spot clean um, as long as you keep up with your snakes and you spot clean. Then I think it's fine. Um, the coconut, um, the coconut fiber, coconut husk um, from like Reptid Chip uh, keeps really great moisture in there. So I mean, it's, I you don't get as many um, stuck sheds. Um, aspen, you get you know more stuck sheds if you don't if you don't mist it every so often. But you can't mist it too much or it'll mold and all that kind of stuff. But um, I definitely favor the coconut. Um, um, bedding substrate so that answers that question next up last question ball python boulevard is do you do a cool down for, of the room or do you just breed year round um, I don't technically breed year round but at the same time I also don't really do a cool down um, I did one time I did a cool down and I, I done other and then every other year since then I haven't done a cool down and I've gotten about the same results so um, when I did cool down the very first year I bred, I, think I had six breeding females and I had four lay. Um, this last year, um, I had six breeding females, I had four lay and I didn't do any cool down whatsoever. Um, so and I haven't really noticed any difference with anything on that. So um, slug, slug ratio, I'm not noticing any difference with uh, cool down as compared to not having a cool down. Um, I had a couple clutches with slugs this year, but each had like one slug. Um, I think the pinstripe pet desert ghost had two. The year that I did the cool down, the killer blast, I'm um, sorry, the bumblebee, she had four good eggs and two slugs. I did a cool down that year. Um, so, yeah, I really don't do a cool down anymore. I, 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 I used to kind of do it, but um, 
now what I just, I just, I, being here in Wisconsin, I just kind of let, I close the register off. So it, the room stays pretty warm the way it is. Right now it's 81 degrees here midday. I don't have any heat going on in this room besides the, the heat, the heat panels, the heat tape panels um, from my racks. It's the only heat that's in here and that's, um, it's at 90 degrees. So my thermostat actually says a higher amount because I have the, I have the probe right on the heat panel. So the actual amount on, in the tubs on the substrate is about 90 degrees. Um, and I just leave it like that year round. Um, and I've been doing pretty decent last year out of three snakes. I had two lay this year out of six snakes. I had four lay. So, and I didn't do any cool down whatsoever. Left my temperatures exactly the same on my heat panels, left my room temperatures exactly the same. Um, I've heard of other people, you know, they, they do a cool down. Some say that you get a little better results. Some say it's the same. Um, my, my personal experience has been about the same. So, um, there's multiple ways you can do it. These things are really easy to work with. So that's pretty much it. So that is the last question. And sorry for a huge long video. I don't even know how long. It's probably been over an hour. Um, but thank you guys for watching. Uh, I've actually, besides that super pastel surge, yellow belly, I actually plan on bringing out a few other snakes, but actually I ended up focusing so much on the questions and holding on to this girl. Uh, as you can see, she's pretty, she's chilling now. But um, again, awesome looking animals. Um, if you want to see more really great looking animals, keep it up, keep tuned to Hissy Fit Reptiles YouTube channel here. Hoping to get some more stuff um, filmed for you guys. I don't know if I'll have any more ball pythons coming in this year, but there's a lot of my ball pythons that you haven't seen since I got them and they've gotten bigger and some of them are looking better. Um, yeah, I, I'm looking forward to sharing more videos with you guys. Um, definitely ask if you're able to afford even $2 a month if you would like to support me on Patreon, uh, again, the Patreon thing is just kind of, it has to do with my YouTube more so than anything, but I mean, I will be using the funds to kind of, you know, um, more so to show my wife, hey, look, I don't have to work as much at work to pay for my rats that I need to feed the snakes because the way she looks at it is I, if I'm spending money on my rats to feed the snakes, that's money I'm taking off the table to feed my kids. And I don't look at it that way. She looks at it that way. So again, I'm sorry, you know, if, if you feel like I'm, I know I'm not trying to pressure anybody. If you don't want to support me on Patreon, totally fine. As I still appreciate you supporting me here on YouTube, um, just watching my videos. I'll never charge for you guys to watch my videos, but if you would like to support Hissy Fit Reptiles, I'll make sure you get greatly rewarded one way or another um, for supporting me. Uh, $2 is the minimum pledge amount. You can go all the way up to, um, I think, 50 or or $100 I have now. So, um Appreciate any help I can get from you guys. Um, I didn't do the um, I didn't do the shout out thing to my patrons in this video, but I will be doing a couple more videos for sure. That I'm gonna be doing some major shout outs to you guys. Um, cause some of them get two shout out, shout, out, shout outs a month, along with links to their sites and stuff. So so be sure to check that out. Follow me at Hissy Fit Reptiles here on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Um, also, I have my website, hissyfitreptiles.com. If you have any questions whatsoever for me, feel free to contact me in any one of those. Uh, messenger through my Facebook page. I can, I'll try to respond as soon as I can. Also, you can always email me. My email address is hissyfitreptiles at gmail.com. And that's hissyfitreptiles at gmail.com. Thank you guys very much for sticking with me. If you, if you got to this part of the video, you guys are awesome. Thanks for spending like an hour or more with me today. Uh, Appreciate everything you guys do for commenting, liking, and subscribing to me. Uh, feel free to share my content with anybody you want. Um, thank you guys so much for making History of Tiles possible on YouTube.